Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Yashoda Sharma. I am a program director here at the Digital Medicine Society. I will be your host for today's event. I'm very excited to share this inspiring program with you today. So let's get started. Today, we will share with you how digital tools can help you increase diversity in clinical trials. February is Black History Month, and I'm sure many of you have seen countless quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. over the past several weeks. This quote is front and center of the work that we have been doing with this project. Dr. King made this statement 57 years ago. Think about that for a second. Over a half a century ago, Dr. King was talking about inequality and injustice in healthcare. And 57 years later, we're still talking about it. And shamefully, inequality and injustice in healthcare is still a very harsh reality for too many people. Tackling this type of injustice is what this project team aimed to do. We have 19 organizations, leading organizations from across the clinical trials ecosystem who stepped up to help tackle this problem, all with the goal of improving and increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion in the clinical trial design process. This project is sponsored by DIME or the Digital Medicine Society. DIME is a global research and education society dedicated to advancing the ethical, effective, equitable, and safe use of digital medicine to redefine healthcare and ultimately improve lives. DIME sits at the intersection of healthcare and technology. Historically, these industries have existed in silos, but with the rapid evolution of digital health technologies, it is imperative that healthcare and technology work together to advance digital medicine. Everything we do at DIME is powered by expertise from across the healthcare ecosystem. Everything we do at DIME is informed by the patient voice. We are proud to say that DIME delivers clinical quality work on a tech timeline. There are three pillars to the work we do at DIME. The first is community. We partner with experts from across healthcare and technology to identify opportunities for advancing digital medicine. We conduct research and resource development to address some of the most pressing challenges to the use of digital technologies in healthcare. And through our communication and education efforts, we inform and educate stakeholders from across the ecosystem. All of our resources are, free, are open source and freely available to everyone so that together we can advance digital medicine. DIME decided to take on the challenge of diversity, equity, and inclusion in clinical trials. Everyone's talking about this topic, and I'm sure you're more used to hearing D, E, and I, as if it's one word, one little thing that needs to be solved. We know very well that it's not. Each of these entities, diversity, equity, and inclusion need to be addressed separately and then together. This is the only way that we will be able to advance health equity. We've seen the consequences of a system with lack of diversity, lack of equity, and lack of inclusion on our public health system. We need to do better. And that starts with addressing each of these entities. Over the past 11 months, this project team has been working to develop resources to 
to help you use digital tools to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in clinical trials. These resources are organized along three steps. The first is to assess. Assess opportunities for utilizing digital tools to be more diverse, more equitable, and more inclusive with your trials. Second is to identify. Identify which digital tools are best suited to each step of the design process. And then implement. Implement specific actions guided by our person-centered principles. The resources answer two big questions. The first, why should you use digital tools? Digital tools can be applied to every step of the clinical trial process, from engagement and enrollment to data analysis and health outcomes. Traditional, tra traditional trials are experiencing many challenges right now. Our resources will help you identify the best digital tools to address many of these challenges while also advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. The second question, how can you use digital tools? Start by learning about each of the tools and learn how each can be applied to each step of the clinical trial process. This resource, Elements of a dig Digitized Clinical Trial, gives you examples of how each of these tools are being used at each step of the clinical trial process. All of the resources that we have created will help you advance diversity, equity, and inclusion with the use of digital tools. Our resources will help you use digital tools to identify populations who can benefit from your trial, populations who have been historically have been excluded. Our digital tools will help you design and implement inclusive engagement plans. We have resources to help you use digital tools to begin to build trust, to empower participants, and to support your clinical trial teams. Digital tools can be used to hold yourself and the industry accountable. And we have resources to show you how digital tools can help you collaborate and share best practices and innovations with leaders across the clinical trial ecosystem so that together we can advance health equity. This is an enormous problem, one that can only be solved by all of us working together. And that's exactly what this project team has been doing. So now it's time to take action. We have Dr. Robert Califf, FDA commissioner is here to tell you how the FDA is taking action. But first we will start with some of the leaders from our project team to share with you how they are using digital tools to increase diversity in clinical trials. This is a discussion, we wanna hear from you. So please feel free to use the chat to make any comments. And if you have questions, please put them in the question and answer box. The panelists will be available towards the end of our session to answer your questions. And now I would like to invite Ricky Fairley, CEO of Touch the Black Breast Cancer Alliance to, to come on camera and join me. And I would like to share with you a poll to just get us started. Great to be here with you, Yashoda. Thank you, Ricky. We'll give everyone uh, about 30 seconds to, to complete the poll. Um, and the results from this poll will be shared with you uh, later with um, the recording as well as the slides. It's great to see some, uh, so many of you engaged with this question. All right, we'll let it go a little bit longer since uh, results are still coming in. All right, I think we can stop the poll now. Ricky, 
you have been an inspiration to me, to our mm -hmm. project team, and to everyone who has had the pleasure of being in front of you. You're so sweet. You came into the clinical trials world by way of a devastating diagnosis, and you turned that into becoming a leader and a change maker in this space. Can you please share your journey with us? Sure. And it has been such an incredible pleasure to be among this brain trust of, of, of just brilliance. It's been so, just, I'm, I'm going to miss you when we're done with this project because um, you've been an inspiration to me as well in, in my work and um, just the, the power that we've had in our room that we shared together has been amazing. But I'll start with my story and, you know, I'm here to bring the patient voice. So I was diagnosed with stage 3A triple negative breast cancer and um, kind of stopped me in my tracks. I was your typical crazy working mom, mother and business person. And, um, and I'm like, what do you mean breast cancer? How'd that happen? How can I fix it fast? Right? Because I don't have time. And um, I had a double mastectomy. I did six rounds of standard of care chemo. I did six weeks of radiation. I was said, okay, Ricky, you're now no evidence of disease going with your life, but come back in at a, for a year checkup. Went back for my checkup and um, they found five spots on my chest wall. And my doctor said, okay, you are now metastatic. We don't have any more drugs for you. You have two years to live, get your affairs in order. And I said, well, I can't really die right now. I have a daughter at Dartmouth. She's a sophomore. I've got to pay for her education. So me, you and God and some drugs or something, we got to work this out. What have you got for me? And she really didn't have any experience with triple negative breast cancer. Not very many people did. So I went to Dr. Google. And on the third page of Dr. Google, I found the triple negative breast cancer foundation, which was pretty small back then because everything else on Google was, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die fast. So I called them and they gave me an amazing doctor, Ruth O'Regan. She was probably one of about five doctors at the time that was actually researching triple negative breast cancer, which black women get at three times the rate. It's a horrible disease. And we don't really know why. And she put me on two drugs that were experimental. So I became a science project for the next five months. And um, two drugs that she's, we're not sure if these are gonna work, but we're trying them on triple negative and we're gonna try them. And I didn't die and it's been 11 years. And so I know I have a God job. God left me here to do this work and it's my purpose. And I've been doing advocacy ever since. And those drugs are now standard of care for triple negative breast cancer. So um, I was happy to be part of science, even though I didn't really realize it at the time, I was more fighting for my life. But um, I, you know, I work for my granddaughters. I have three grandbabies and um, they are my purpose. I want breast cancer to go away. And so we have a lot of work to do in this space. And it's going to happen with science. It's going to happen with science. And, you know, as I started my advocacy journey, I went back and I looked and dug in the history of the drugs that we have as standard of care for triple negative breast cancer, for breast cancer. And um, there were no black women in those trials. There were no black women. And so when you look at the numbers for us, we have a 41% higher mortality rate than white women. We have a 39% higher recurrence rate of breast cancer than white women. We're getting triple negative breast cancer, the, you know, the nasty one at three times the rate of white women. And the statistic that really upsets me the most is that black women under 35 get breast cancer at twice the rate and die at three times the rate of white women well before they would have that first mammogram at 40. And it's just unacceptable. And we aren't in the science. And, you know, when I think like, what's going on here? The drugs are not working for us. We don't have the drugs that we need to work most effectively because they were never tested on black bodies. And so this topic is so important to me to get more black women into research. And I spend every day kind of talking to our pharma partners to tell them that their baby is ugly. We have to fix it. And so we have a lot of work to do to get rid of this ugly baby. So I'm so happy to do this with you today. Thank you, Ricky. You know, I've heard that story a couple of times, but I'm still always amazed just to that you went from hearing that news to seeing an opportunity to do good, but not only for yourself, but for thousands of women and families. Um, this is what we need. This, this optimism, this hope is exactly what we need to get to uh, health equity. And so thank you so much 
for being here. Uh, Ricky, I would love to turn it over to you uh, to lead us through the rest of our program today. Great, great, great. And it's a little scary for me. I'm usually on the panel, not the moderator, but um, but I'm happy to do this with it. And I'm so happy to talk about this important topic. You know, we, we hear often that Black and Hispanic people don't trust clinical trials. And there's this sort of looming thing, in the, I call it like the cloud around us of that earned medical mistrust. It's definitely out there, you know, but we've done a lot of research that validates that there's a lot more than that, than the trust. I think that's something we have to address, but I think it's also education that we have to address. And we have this great brain trust of people to talk about that today. Um, but, you know, um, it's a primary reason that we have to talk about, and it's not a simple thing to tackle you know, all of these things. So I'd love to invite um, Shelly and Arquez onto the screen with me. Are you guys here? We are. Good Very morning. Good. So great to have, have you guys. So can you guys um, introduce yourselves? Because you'll do a better job than me. And then we'll kind of get into the questions. Shelly, you want to go first? Yeah, of course. I'm Shelly Pavone. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Enlightened. Great. And what does Enlightened do? Enlightened is a network of healthcare providers and professionals, and we connect those professionals with industry for consulting and advisory, and we are on a mission to ensure that more uh, clinical researchers and uh, PIs and sub-PIs from racial and ethnic minorities are involved in clinical trials. Great, great, great. So glad to have you. And our kids. Hi, good morning. Ricky, I just love your story. Every time I hear it, I get so inspired. So uh, to, to the audience, our Kes Starling, I'm the founder and CEO of Ravellis Clinical Services. Ravellis is a health equity focused clinical research company committed to expanding the representation of clinical trials and, and removing barriers that have long existed for particularly for minorities and underserved communities. Uh, we leverage integrated technology that includes ePro, telehealth, uh, connected devices and direct data capture. And we pair that up with decentralized clinical trial support services to improve uh, patient access and reduce the burden on patients and their care providers so that they can participate in clinical trials. Such important work because the burden shouldn't be on the patient. The patient's sick and scared. <laughs> and then the burden should be somewhere else to help the patient, right? So much to talk about here. So our first question is, what do you guys say to those who state that certain populations are just not included because of trust, they don't trust. I mean, like, is that a barrier that just stops everything, right? You know, I would say, I think that it's important to make sure that people that are involved in research understand why there is a lack of trust first. Um, you know, ultimately, um, they, there needs to be acknowledgement that there's a legacy of abuse in human research and, and also recognizing the biases that still impact racial and ethnic minorities. I mean, just assuming, right, that people don't want to participate because of trust is an implicit bias. And I think that there's been a growing body of research that suggests that minorities are willing to participate in research when provided an invitation and opportunity. And when there is education involved in that as well. And I think that um, making sure that the institutions that are carrying out the research make considerations about the people who are participating from a research side, right? Making sure that their clinicians have, have training. And then of course, engaging um, with PIs and research staff that already work within these communities can be very helpful and, and go a long way for establishing that trust as well. That's awesome. How about you, Arquez? Well, I, I absolutely agree with Shelley. I think one of the things is, is for me is really starting with a definition of trust. Again, you know, it's, uh, you know, if you look up in the dictionary, it, it states that it's a firm belief uh, in reliability and truth and ability and the strength of someone. Trust in itself tends to be future oriented. And uh, this is my personal opinion, but I believe trust is, is a decision. It's not a feeling. And it's often to, uh, followed up by of that, uh, of, of, of demonstrating characteristics of trustworthiness. So being empathetic, being accessible, being approachable, showing respect for patients, um, being able to communicate uh, and, and having representation. These are all characteristics. These are all actions that leads to being trustworthy. And so I really do think it's important that to, to Shelly's point that we acknowledge that we have, we have you know, well, a well-earned history of mistrust but through knowledge and through education, 
most patients can over, overcome mistrust uh, and to move forward to having, a, again, an informed decision. Yeah, I think that's so true. You know, as a patient, you want to trust your doctor, right? You want to trust the doctor. You, you know, there's this sort of belief that they went to medical school for 40,000 years, so they got to be doing the right thing by me. And, and we know in our breast cancer research that um, most women will say they were never asked by their doctor. And so you don't even, you even get to this, they don't even know about it. So education plays such a role. I think also voice in education plays a role. So we can talk about that. You know, what is, who is the voice of trust, right? When you have these conversations, right? But, but I love that it's, um, that it's a decision. It is a decision that I'm going to trust like any relationship, right? So what do you think it means for trial participants and public audience members to trust the organizations designing and implementing the trials? Do you think there's trust there? So, so I think one of the things that we need to start with for steady stakeholders is to, there's often, uh, we fail to make the distinction between a patient visiting a practice out of medical necessity versus a steady participant in research as a volunteer. So I think it's really important that we start there, that a study participant or a study patient, this, a decision you make to participate in, in, a, in a study stems first and foremost from having trust that he or she has a relationship in that investigator and their research team. So that's why it's important that representation matters. Uh, right. when you see, you know, you see evidence of that. You've seen evidence of the outcomes uh, where uh, when you have representation in the workforce and and those that are engaging in clinical trials, you see where it actually improves uh, outcomes and improves communication. There are so many, uh, you know, again, uh, tangible benefits of, of having representation, which leads to fostering trust, which is a really important part. Right, Shelley? I absolutely agree with Arquez. I mean, I think we know that minority patients are more likely to trust a provider from a background similar to their own. And I think that it's very often that the race of the physician often influences the racial makeup of the clinical trial volunteers that they inspire towards participation. And so, yeah, I think representation is huge and making sure that the um, clinical trial staff reflects the participants, right? Um, and of course, that they, those staff members have the kind of the training and, and they understand how to communicate appropriately with those people because Arquez is right, they're volunteering their time, right, to do this and to help others. And so I think that that is incredibly important to establish trust. Right. I want to go someplace and see people who look like me. Hello. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. My comfort zone. Right. Right. How are your organizations addressing, you know, addressing the trust issue? Shelley, well, how would you answer that one? Um, so as I just said, you know, um, racial and ethnic minorities are more likely to trust a provider from a background similar to their own, but there is a lack of diverse representation in clinical trials, and that also applies, of course, to the clinical trial personnel. And so for us, um, you know, we're focusing on the investigators, right? We are trying to demonstrate the power and potential of of digital and our digital network to diversify the clinical trials workforce by using our network to expand the pool of minority principal investigators. And we have the hope that, you know, that will build trust and also improve the, the diversity of clinical trial participants. And ultimately, the, the end goal, of course, is to, to better demonstrate the safety and efficacy of new medicines for, for all populations. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Marquez? Yeah, for Ravellas, we're really focused on really addressing some of the challenges around trial accessibility. If we think about the access, 70% of patients living greater than two hours from the research site, where we've saw a greater opportunity, it's really lean in on this ability to bring trials to patients, really addressing the physical divide as well as the digital divide by leveraging a suite of solutions. And one of the ways that you know we bring trials closer to patients is being able to leverage uh, in-home support services. So we actually have a network of providers, nurses, mobile phlebotomists that, uh, that are local to the communities in which the patients live. And those providers are able to be uh, deployed uh, uh, and to engage patients in their home uh, to support clinical procedures. So I, I, when you think about trust, I think one of the things that I've always felt very strongly, uh, one of the greatest demonstrations of trust is to let someone in your home. So being able to bring 
clinical trials to patients, meeting where they are, really does prove, it demonstratively proves, uh, improves the patient's willingness to participate. It demonstrably shows an increase in retention and reducing that burden on those patients. So being able to you know, really hone in on bringing clinical trials to patients in the comfort of the home is certainly a part of that. And using local providers that are from that community that speak their language is a part of how we facilitate trust as well. That's so awesome. And I mean, if we could go back to the old days where doctors made home visits, right? I mean, because there was ultimate trust and, and um, but bringing the best care. And, you know, for, for breast cancer and young black women, the um, a clinical trial is the best treatment option, you know, and people just don't know that, you know, they don't know that, that their, their, their fear gets in the way of that. And I, what we see too, is it's fear of the unknown. It's for just not understanding how a trial works, that that Advil you took last week for a headache was in a clinical trial, that, that, that heart medicine you give your dog was in a clinical trial. You know, people just don't understand the basics of it, but when they're educated, in the right voice, you know, from somebody they trust, then it works, right? And then in their home is even better. So all of all of this technology, oppor- all te- technological opportunities to bring a trial in a different way, is so critical to getting getting the drugs that we need. Um, what role does transparency play with building trust, and how should trial designers and, and implementers address the transparency? And you kind of touched on that a little bit, but. I mean, I think it's really important to consider some of the the questions that participants might have, right? I mean, if if we have these populations that aren't even being told about clinical trials, and when we get to the point of engaging these communities, we need to be really prepared for the types of questions that they might have when it comes to participating in research. You know, um, maybe they have concerns about their personal information or how their data will be stored, you know, what will be done with the information that's used. And I think it's so important to empower participants with knowledge about the trial. Um, and ultimately, you're, you're building trust by in giving them as much knowledge and, and power as possible possible in this system that they're not typically involved in, right? I'm sure that when you first joined the trial, it was overwhelming. It would be for anybody who hasn't done this on a regular basis. And so as much knowledge as you can have, and and also just engaging the community and and trying to be as uh, straightforward as possible. Um, You know, when throughout this process with DIME, we created a lot of resources, and one of them is focused on empower with information and education. Um, And I think that that's like a really great uh, resource to point to, to say, okay, information empowers everybody, give them the ability to learn as much as they possibly can about the trial and the goals and how all of their information will be handled. Yeah. And it's interesting because at the end of the day, the person, the patient just wants to live, you know, especially when you're talking about cancer, I just want to live. I'll do anything to live. Right. And when you break it down with the right voice, then they they sign up. I can convince a breastie to do a trial in five minutes because I'm talking, right? So, and I think as we think about how we communicate and how we educate, the voice of the patient can be really, really powerful in this conversation. So, and the, so the, of the environment, but also the voice of the patient. I think we may have lost our cast. Did we lose him? Um, Anyway, so, um, you know, I think that we, um, you know, it's a hard thing to build and it's easy to destroy trust, right? You can, so it's so important that in every piece of sort of this chain of communication to, the, to a patient, you have to be diligent and intentional about how you're going to make trust happen, right? Um, and how does your pro- work on this project or kind of the resources we've come up with move us closer to getting where we need to be with getting that, Shelly. What I love about this project in particular is that, you know, there are a lot of people that are trying to make an impact on this particular area of clinical trials, and that's excellent. We need that. But this project to me has always been about the deliverables, right? Like how are we actually going to show an impact? And so I mean, there are so many resources that that have come out of this particular project itself. I mean, you know, if we think about um, 
supporting clinical trials staff or developing patient support networks, right? Um, developing right. community partnerships. There is guidance without throughout the kind of dime resources that have been launched as a part of this project. So to me, it, you can take it from the very beginning and there are, are different guides and different resources at every step of the way. And I think that um, you know, there's there's recognizing the need for diversity, right? There's understanding how that ties to the business goals and objectives. Right. There's focusing on um, the plan for diverse, equitable, and inclusive engagement. And so from my perspective, I think that this particular project and, and having so many different voices, you know, from industry and people representing the clinician voice and the patient voice has, has made this... Um, really a, a wonderful kind of arsenal of material yeah. to, to show like, here's how we, we establish trust. Here's how we move this forward. I'm so proud of our work. I'm so proud of us. So I'm, I'm going to turn this back over to our lovely Lena Shoda to um, bring on the commissioner. So we're going to go off screen. Great. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you, Shelly. And unfortunately, our has dropped off. Um, but I would love to turn it over to Jennifer Golsack, the CEO of DIME, uh, to take us to the next session. Um, fantastic. Thanks so much, Yashoda. And Ricky, I'm going to echo your comments. I'm incredibly proud of this team. Um, and I'll do a quick introduction of myself before I go ahead um, and welcome our guests for today. So hi, everyone. Jen Goldsack, CEO here at the Digital Medicine Society. Uh, delighted to be welcoming you all as we launch these critically important resources today. Um, and before I do welcome um, our guests that I'm incredibly proud to have joining us today for some comments, um, I also want to take a moment um, and recognize that I'm welcoming uh, Dr. Califf, um, uh, Commissioner of the FDA, on behalf of this extraordinary project team. Um, they're extraordinary for two reasons. First of all, I think the vision that they shared with us when they came to the table, their vision of a reimagined future of clinical trials in the digital era um, that worked for everyone, that served everyone, that developed products that we could be confident are safe and effective for everyone was so powerful and inspired all of us here in DIME, not just within this project, but across our portfolio. I also want to recognize this team for their leadership. What you'll see is not only are we launching a suite of resources uh, today to try and help you in your work to diversify, um, uh, uh, be more equitable and be more inclusive in clinical trials in the digital era, but we have over 50 examples of these leaders in the field already demonstrating what's possible today. So again, thank you to this project team. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you for your vision and congratulations on what you've put into the field today. And so with that, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Rob Califf, FDA Commissioner. Rob, I feel like if I went through your many accomplishments in this field and did your formal introduction, I could eat up almost all of our time together. So perhaps I'll take a moment and just thank you on a personal level. Uh, what folks may not know is while I was working using digital tools and you know real world data and was uh, the nutter who uh, thought that we should be uh, hiring data scientists at a big healthcare system before I moved into the clinical trial space, um, and we hired some of those first data scientists. When I first, first started working with digital tools in clinical trials, I had the privilege of doing so uh, with Rob. Um, Rob, you've uh, sort of shared a vision with me that's been powerful and inspired so much of the work that we do here at DIME. Thank you for your leadership in the field. Thank you for your vision. What you'll see is so much of this work actually builds off the paper you wrote um, on digitized clinical trials. And so with that, Thank you for joining us today. Um, and I'll invite you to share perhaps just a couple of remarks on your vision for the future for a sort of clinical trials in the digital era and your vision for being more diverse, more equitable and more inclusive in the way we develop and deploy medical products. Well, thanks, Jennifer. Actually, given the course of my everyday life now of getting pilloried on a daily basis by politicians, it would have been great to have heard, uh, you know, uh, laudable statements about all my great um, accomplishments, but I, I, I'm perfectly fine with it. And um, I'll just make a couple of uh, comments um, that I hope will be um, helpful. And it's it's great to pitch in with the effort that you all are making. I'm seeing some old friends both on the screen when I was listening in a few minutes ago, and also in the 
chat room. So that's really nice to see. I think, you know, we all know that, um, I mean, clinical trials are really just uh, an effort to use an experimental paradigm to understand um, in the case of therapeutic interventions, um, whether something is safe and effective and in many other situations, whether the comparison of one thing to another leads to a different set of health outcomes that we can expect. And from that perspective, I think there are two things that are obvious and unstoppable. The first is that um, digitization is going to continue to evolve in much more expansive directions, just like it is in everyday life. And the second is that um, the, the scope in terms of the depth of um, uh, dimensions of human beings that are participating is going to grow uh, along with it. Now, having said that, you know, what's the vision for the future? I, you know, looking from the perspective of FDA, it just seems clear that we are moving rapidly into a world in which most things that we do will be hybrid. And I'll go through some of the reasons for that that involve, you know, full on digital front ends to and back ends to a lot of things, but also depending on the circumstances and the purpose of the trial involve nuts and bolts, human interaction and human labor as a key part of what needs to happen. I'll just leave it at that for the future, but um, just a couple of cautions here, because um, I, I, I get a sense you all are uh, very enthusiastic. You should be. I don't want to dampen the enthusiasm, but I want to give you uh, just sort of a list of the things that I worry about in both the digital and the diversity dimensions. The, the first is um, we cannot take it for granted, and you may have already discussed this, that digitization is going to increase diversity or equity. In fact, I would say my experience having worked in a big tech company is even when people tried really hard to make it that way, um, this quote that I'll give you from an article I would urge you to read, um, it, the, the title of the article is The Pandemic's Legacy is Already Clear. It's in the Atlantic. Um, and uh, the the quote is, technological solutions tend to rise into society's penthouses while epidemics seep into its cracks. And I would say left untended, uh, that is, if there's no specific intention and investment, those who are wealthy and highly educated are going to take advantage of technology preferentially and get the most out of it compared to those who are not wealthy and highly educated. And overcoming that, I believe, takes uh, very much a conscious effort and investment to make it work. Now, I know part of what you all are talking about are investments that people are making, but um, we've just got to keep reminding ourselves of that. The second part about the technology is I can't stress enough the importance of validation. I know that's what... Um, Dime, uh, in general, is very focused on, and for good reason. A lot of things that just make common sense, like we ought to be able to measure someone's activity by putting an activity monitor uh, on them as opposed to having them do a six-minute walk test in a clinic. That just makes sense. But unless you directly deal with the meaning of missing data, artifact, and the relationship between the measurements that you're making and tangible health outcomes that we're confident about, um, you can spend a lot of time and money and end up with a result of a clinical trial which doesn't translate into a change in practice. So that's technology. On diversity, um, uh, we're just looking at a lot of data right now, uh, both from NIH and FDA, and I think um, I, I would just say a lot of progress has been made in terms of what I would call the traditional and key elements of diversity, sex, race, ethnicity. Um, in those categories, if you look at NIH, it's really almost right on the money in terms of representativeness 
uh, in entry in clinical trials compared to the population. Now it varies by disease, but the average of it all taken together looks very close. And that's a that's a result of very purposeful policies and laws that have been passed. If you look at regulated FDA trials, a lot of progress has been made, but it's complicated by some factors. Um, most notably that we are a country of uh, 340 million people in the US. There are 8 billion people that live in the world and we're dealing with a global industry. And in fact, if you look at enrollment in the US, when that happens, um, you'll see a lot of progress in terms of those traditional um, measures of diversity, which I wanna stress are basal and critically important because of our history um, of exclusion uh, that's very clear. And as far as I know, no one argues about that history. And the goal now is to, um, is to fix it. But as we fix that problem, we've also got to um, take into account the next steps and begin to think about those, not to forget about the first steps and the basal steps, but um, there are many other dimensions of diversity that we need to account for. Um, if we just look within the US, um, it's obvious that um, economics, education, and um, where you live are critical elements of diversity. Um, that, um, and it's perfectly possible to have a sex and race and ethnicity uh, mix that looks like our country and not take into account any of those factors. Um, so we have to consider those. And beyond that, there are factors like age and weight that are important for many of the trials that we um, are dealing with at the FDA that deal with medical products um, in particular. And uh, those are just the beginning. There are many, many other elements of diversity within the US. The beauty of digitization is that there's no technical reason why we can't include the full spectrum. And there's no technical reason why we can't do the trials at a much lower cost, which would, within the research budgets that we have, enable larger trials to be done. I think anyone who knows me knows I've never seen a trial that I thought was too large. Um, we always learn more if we enroll more people than the minimum needed. And I know the pressure is often the other way because of the financing of it and the fact that people want to um, uh, put as few people at risk in clinical trials as they have to in order to get the answer. But um, if we're thinking about diversity as a factor, uh, we, we need to really embrace the statistical fact that having a representative sample in a trial which is only um, sized to get the primary answer doesn't allow us to draw inferences about the subgroups in that population because we don't have statistical power to draw conclusions. In other words, we will have many, many false positives and false negatives when we look at those subgroups. Um, th there are a few other really important things within the U.S., but I also want to mention that um, if you extrapolate what I think are sound um, principles of human studies and also um, ethics, um, we do want representation in our clinical trials, no matter what. But if we extrapolate that to the whole world, we've got a whole set of problems that we haven't even started to deal with yet. There are over 250 ethnicities in the world that are recognized. Um, and, you know, uh, people, uh, no matter where they live, um, hopefully will be entitled to um, effective treatments that have been uh, studied um, in that uh, population. And of course, Asia has two thirds of the world's population. So if we want to be representative of the world, we've got a whole different set of issues that we're not even addressing. And uh, a, a, a distant friend, someone who I've met, uh, Mohammed Pat, uh, Pate, was just named head of Gavi. Um, and it brought to light an interesting discussion within the FDA. The continent of Africa is essentially left out of clinical trials, except for uh, infectious disease or 
vaccine trials, except for South Africa, but in the mainstream of uh, medical interventional therapies, we've got a whole continent that's left out if we're talking about diversity. And uh, there are opportunities there that will arise. And then uh, the last caution has to do with something I heard uh, at the end of the last session. I've been uh, someone who believes that we should move the rhetoric from research subject to participant, but I don't believe we should do that in a way that causes us to lose sight of the fact that there is risk involved in clinical trials. It's still the case if you look at all the um, drugs that start in phase one uh, that we oversee at the FDA, close to 90% of them don't make it to market because the toxicity or risk outweighs the benefit or there's no benefit to be measured. So um, when people do volunteer for clinical trials, um, I believe they get much better care. I think that's uh, documented now because of the protocol and the environment that the trial uh, is in for the most part. But we also don't want to have the therapeutic misconception to have people believe that because they're in a trial, they're necessarily going to do better, that um, there are risks that we need to be cognizant of. So as we design digital trials, we worry a lot about can we collect the right data. We also have to uh, be concerned about are we measuring the right things and in the right environment to deal with the risks that may come up um, as we design these trials. So uh, I'm really excited about what you all are doing. It's great. I'll leave you with a few cautions and things to think about and uh, wish you good luck with the meeting. Um, Rob, thank you so much. Fantastic comments. Um, appreciate the support. And I want to very quickly reflect on three, I think, very important things you mentioned um, before I turn it back to um, our uh, MCs for the day. So first of all, you know, you mentioned our enthusiasm for technology, and that's certainly true. But what I think is really important is that we're certainly not tech determinists. We sort of embrace this same language that you do, that we're talking about digitized clinical trials and not digital clinical trials. And I think that distinction is critically important. And you teased out the fact that there are tools available today that can begin to support the generation of higher quality evidence easier access, you know, better inclusion, all of these sorts of things, um, but certainly absent the clinical experts and that human touch, none of this happens. So we share a similar vision there. Um, I also really appreciated the point you meant around intention and investment. I think we are naive if we simply depend on these tools, these inanimate objects to go in and, so, and solve some of these most pressing and persistent challenges. We have to be intentional. We must make the investment. And what excites us here is that we're at this watershed moment where we are reimagining how we build a clinical trial around the participant and not the clinic. And how can we reimagine that future state such that it works for every single person our industry exists to serve? Um, and then the third point that I really appreciated, and this is mirrored um, across our whole DIME portfolio and not just this work, is you spoke about different vectors of inclusion. We need to think, you know, very hard about race, ethnicity, about gender. We haven't got those all sex. We haven't got those right yet. But there are all of these other vectors. And unless we are being intentional, unless we are designing tools, solutions and trials, with all of those things in mind, we aren't gonna be successful. So I appreciated your comment that there's no technical reason why we can't do this well today. That means it's up to us. So Rob, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate everything you do. Uh, appreciate your remarks. Um, and with that, we'll turn it back to Yashoda and Ricky. Thank you very much, Jen. Thank you, Dr. Caleb. Um, Ricky, we have such a wonderful program planned. I don't want to take up any time at all. So I will pass it back over to you to take us to the next session. Great. That was such a great conversation, though. So I so appreciate the commissioner. So many good nuggets in there to think about. And, and you know, just hearing it from his perspective is so different from our perspective, you know, but, um, but I love that. Um, so let's talk about um, the lack of diverse participants who meet the study inclusion criteria as something that's an excuse. Right. So we're, we often hear that um, that, um, um, you know, that's an excuse. Let's talk about that with Reggie and Ashish. Can you guys come on? 
and introduce yourselves. Ashish, I see you. Yes. <laughs> I can't hear. You want to introduce yourself? Thank you. Yes, Dean. please. Hi, uh, Ruki, I'm Ashish Chaturvedi, and I'm founder and CEO of Althea.ai. And Althea is a uh, health equity and diversity and inclusion platform. Uh, it's a artificial intelligence platform which help you manage throughout the life cycle, right from the research state to end complete clinical trial, manage at each stage your diversity, inclusion, and uh, equity. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for coming and being here. Reggie. All right. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm glad to be here on the panel and, and being able to discuss uh, you know, what we do and what, what, uh, why it means so much was to talk about diversity. Uh, so I'm Reginald Swift, founder, CEO of Rubis Life Sciences, and we are a, I wouldn't be able to say it this way, we are a uh, emancipatory research and development company, as well as a contract research organization, you know, launching clinical trials in hard to reach areas. Most of our areas are going to be found in remote locations like Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, um, you know, Socotora. If you, people don't know where that is, that's actually 100 miles away from Somalia. Uh, we've actually launched trials in nations of Africa, about, about uh, eight uh, countries to be exact. And whether it's an infectious disease, rare disease, ultra rare, um, as well as uh, infectious disease, I mean, and also oncology, we're starting to look at how uh, patients who are migrating from coast to coast or location to location uh, help generate evidence based on, you know, following that patient, right? Being able to tell that story of that patient. So we don't look at it as us being focused on diversity. We're just trying to make sure that everybody's included in specific trials, right? And we're going to design trials in those hard to reach locations. And that is what we do. And we, we've done it more so for the government, hence why we're all in these areas. Uh, but we we are certainly now starting to launch more in uh, in the commercial space. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's, I love what you said about you know kind of the the opposite of inclusion, just including everybody. What a concept, right? Um, so <laughs> let's get into this. Um, data is a bit of a chicken and or an egg problem, right? There isn't enough data on many populations to know if a drug would be safe and effective. So these populations are excluded, right? But then how will you ever know? Have, there's enough data for them to be included. Like, how do you sort of manage that conundrum of getting that right mix? Right. Um, so, Ricky, we faced this problem right when we started working in this space three years back. And the first problem was is there a kind of curated data set which is available? And there wasn't any which brings all the diversity equity together. Uh, so we started first curating a data set. Uh, we took over like 25 plus data sources, both public and private. And then we curated uh, 165 measures of inequity, uh, whether it is from social determinants of health or uh, socioeconomic factors. Uh, we brought them all together, curated a data of inequity across the country, uh, where you can go from county to county or zip code to zip code and understand what kind of uh, social determinants of health or other inequity factors are there. On top of that, we brought uh, the data from disease incidence prevalence uh, to understand that, you know, where disease prevalence is, where uh, the kind of inequities are high. And then we brought all the historical clinical trials information on top of that. Uh, so what happens is now you understand better that where inequities are, where uh, historically critical trials have happened and where the high incidence of disease is. Uh, the fourth thing we did, we brought all the physicians information and uh, um, integrated the national provider data to that. So now you understand both first where inequities are, where you have the diverse population, where uh, the incidence is high and historical clinical trials have not happened but you also have the right clinical expertise available to do a trial. So by putting all this data together, uh, we can go and pinpoint, if you say, uh, for lung cancer. When we looked at it, there are uh, over uh, 40 plus counties which have very high uh, incidence. Their physicians are available, oncology centers are there, but no clinical trials have happened there. So those kind of information at the individual disease level 
and pinpointing where we should uh, you know, take our trials. The point which was made earlier, we don't always bring patients to the trials, we take trials to the patients. So this data enables you to, to pinpoint and go there. Yeah, so even essential to Ashish's point, um, you know, much of what we learn overseas is that there's not enough infrastructure to be able to actually aggregate, you know, data sets, right? So what we have been able to do is create digital fencing and digital environments in which we can be able to allow hospitals that are still in the manual or archaic or analog, you know, data gathering, data setting, and being able to kind of upload it within a framework in which we're able to digitize that mechanism. Right. And to, to Shisha's point, now that we're coming here into the States and working with the VA with, with six different visions, uh, we're starting to see and do our heat mapping exercises where those deserts are, those clinical research deserts. So from those you know, capacities, we're going into those local community clinics uh, or FQHCs or uh, any specific hybrid versions of it and being able to enable those, uh, those digital environments to be able to capture data from those types of patients, right, that are in those locations. And then we're coming in to help augment those specific types of uh, data setting or data gathering so that we can learn more about kind of where patients are coming from, right? Much yeah. like you were saying from registries, from SDOH, from patient reported outcomes, from even mobile devices, right? If they're using mobile devices or like Apple Health or the, the eHealth, or, or any specific app that they're tracking your health, we're being able to try to aggregate that information, of course, with their consent and, and being able to then look at, you know, by county by county, hey, this is kind of the potential opportunity that we see from a disease prevalence percentage and how we can first augment your facility to augment into clinical trials or design clinical trials for, for featuring these types of patients in these communities. We're also working with, I think I saw a, a question or a comment about you know working with Native Americans or Pacific Islanders, that is a large gap, right, in those communities, right? We are working with the Navajo tribes. We are working with the Cherokee tribes as well in, in Arizona, and we are work, working with uh, Seminoles as well in Florida. So it's the same type of mechanism that we're starting to now uh, unpack and being able to start aggregating the right information for each patient, right? So we can learn about how to design with our partners, you know, like Ashish and, and you know many others. Um, to design trials for effective use, right? Or for effect effectiveness. Wow, this real world data is a great way to augment, you know, what we need to know about, about patients and, and getting them into the trials. You know, um, the commissioner talked about kind of reaching the population percentages for and in, in trial participation. And, and for me in breast cancer, you know, there's such a burden of disease on black women that's different that to me, it really needs to be commensurate with the burden of disease. So I think we're making some headway, but we need to make more. And I think this kind of data, you know, aggregation is going to really be helpful there. Um, how do you guys address the concerns for privacy and security while tapping into these, you know, kind of additional data resources? Ashish, you want to take that one? Absolutely. And I think that is a primary concern, which, which is addressed at forefront. Uh, one with the data, we apply the right kind of uh, certifications and right kind of compliances to the data. But later on, also, you don't use uh, identified data when you don't have to. So which means leveraging anonymized data sets uh, takes away a lot of that concern. Uh, we only use identified data where it has to be absolutely used from the patient care perspective or the trial participation perspective. No, I, absolutely. I, I completely agree with Ashish. Um, you know, for us, when we think about data and privacy, uh, because we do work with the government, we already have to have these types of measures and mechanisms in place anyway. Um, if for those not familiar, it's CMMC, CMMI, um, you know, scale of two, three, uh, to be able to kind of be at the highest level to be able to work with these types of individuals, because at, on a day-to-day -day basis, we are exchanging sensitive information. So for us, is that we already incorporate that type of framework into our daily activities in the first place, whether we're searching through anonymized data sets or not. But to Ashish's point is that if we can leverage as much anonymized data sources as much as possible, then that can help us leverage as far as, okay, how do we actually use discrete information to start designing, how do we get to real outcomes, right, of data sets that we actually need to aggregate, 
right? How do we actually let us guide, you know, guide us to those types of uh, referential pa patient points that, that we need to actually aggregate, right? From specific centers, from specific locations, right. Right. right? And that helps us allow us to, to use that journey to start learning about what we need to do as an industry versus what, what we need to do to be able to reach the patient, right? So that we can design our effective use or devices or digitize, you know, solutions to those patients or for, and for those patients. Or just be more granular about what you're, get, you know, getting access to. That's so awesome. Mm -hmm. um, what else do you think is needed to get the most out of these resources? Like what else can we be doing? So I think one point I let kind of break it that uh, it's not just about recruiting and bringing the, the diverse and uh, equitable kind of uh, patients on. It's also keeping them in trial because that's a, that's a big expense to run a trial. And if you have the drop-offs which happening in between, that becomes a challenge. So that is where the journey is to really um, support those patients, not only in the trial, but also look at their social care, social uh, determinants and help address them as, a, as part of the trial. Uh, this is where the right targeting and right uh, holding of the patients and keeping them in trial becomes important. No, absolutely. Um, and, and I, I, you know, to Shisha's point, I mean, yes, absolutely correct. And even extending beyond that, I think uh, what's even needed is finding a way that um, we can actually look at the journey of, of the patient, right, beforehand, right? Because most of the time, what we see is that what if a patient happens to transition, right, in between sets, right? We don't even capture that, right? There's no specific type of capture point on how we do that, right? What if there's specific ways on, on saying, you know what, but look at Mormonism, right? Look at specific cultural differences. And what we've learned while doing uh, trials in Nigeria, Uganda, DRC, is that they focus on tribal cultural differences, not color race differences, Right. So being able to redesign that approach for these types of patients on how in America, how they see themselves, you know, versus the way that we see them. I think that will help deconstruct a lot of the the silo approaches that we've had to date. Right. To be able to break down these barriers, to be able to start reaching out on how we can utilize mixed methods to design our uh, trials. Right. So that we can be inclusive, that we can also keep them engaged throughout the whole cycle. Right. Because. If, if I'm still responding to one type of stimulus the whole time, I'm still going to get used to it, but I may, may be fatigued from it. But if using mixed methods where I can say, you know what, let me reach out to you and let me call you or let me sit in front of you for a coffee and, and you know, hand you these uh, type of devices, right? You may better respond in that way uh, by you know, going through that whole journey and you may be kept engaged, right? And that is what we learned. From, from some tribes that we've learned in Nigeria as well, is that that's some of the approaches. And, you know, Dr. Caleb was saying that, um, you know, it's been largely underrepresented, especially with, expect, with the exception of vaccine trials. That is what we learned with vaccine trials uh, in, in Nigeria and uh, DRC. So if we're able to start accommodating these types of approaches and what the, the patient sentiment as an endpoint, right, that is evidence that we can, you know, gather for ourselves to say, you know what, this is the way that we need to start approaching people moving forward, especially how society is changing in today's terms, right? We're it's evolving, ever evolving. Look at the next generation, right? They're they're more conscious, right, to be able to start approaching things with more more fervor on, you know, are you inclusive? Are you actually bringing much more value to, to what we need than to just give us lip service, right? So, you know, those are some of the accommodation points where I think you know, we have some opportunity to, to up in. That's awesome. That's awesome. So we've all been working on this project. How has um, your work on this project and the resources we kind of put together helped move clinical trial system closer to equity? I'm really proud of what we've done. So how do you feel about it? This has been a fantastic experience. I think I have seen this as like first holistic effort we have where we have brought together end-to-end -end thinking. So we're not just thinking like, you know, one aspect of the trial. We are looking at the entire journey and, and keeping it together with the digital resources which we have created. Um, this has been a superb experience. Right. And, and you're right about it has to be intentional from every piece, every piece of the chain, right? And I think we've addressed that, right? Reggie, what do you think? No, I, absolutely. And I, I think um, 
you know, as we came together during the project, we all realized that that uh, we saw the same deficiencies, whether mm -hmm. we were doing projects, you know, to identify in Monroe, Louisiana, right, or Minnetonka, Minnesota, or, you know, some Oakland, California, or specific areas, we started learning about how, um, how we really actually need to gather our resources together, whether you're a service provider, whether you're a sponsor, whether you're, you know, a, a, an agent to help with change, right, as an advisor or a specific uh, advocate, right, for, for groups to move forward. So, we certainly have started created a framework of what diversity actually means for us, but not in its in a, in a traditional sense to say, hey, you know what, this is what DNI represents. But no, how do we look at innovation to capture, you know, diversity? How to capture that innovation, you know, quotient, right, for these types of patients to move forward, right? This is the framework that we can stand to say, you know what, it may not, it, it's going to evolve over time, yes, but it is something that we realize that we needed to all work together to kind of create. So it's like a, almost a Bible, right? So to, to put, be able to put together and say, you know what, let's move into the next generation. I love that. I love it. It is a Bible. And you know, I, what I loved about this work too, is that we had so many of us coming from all different angles. And I think that we're all sort of in this highway going towards Oz where there's no disease, like, but bringing linking the highway together so that we could really figure out better outcomes, you know? So I love that we had this brain trust that's so brilliant and, and we all had a different perspective, but we are all intentional about our piece. So thank you so much. Do you guys have anything else you wanna add? No, I'm good. Nikki, no, it's you. just, it's been a pleasure working. I hope we continue this work together yeah. and, and really just really make an impact for 2023 and beyond. I love that, I love that. Well, great, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. So now we're going to um, pivot. And um, as we think about bringing all the efforts together, let's bring on Kim and uh, Kim from Genentech and um, Pam from Tenarts. You guys there? Hello. Hey, Pam. Hello. Yourself and Kim, want to introduce yourself, you guys? Great. Go ahead, Pam. Pam. Go, for it. Go for it, Pam. <laughs> all right. Well, hi, everyone. I'm Pam Tenarts. I'm the Chief Science Officer at Medable. And we're a decentralized clinical trial platform with a goal and mission of bringing clinical trials to everybody everywhere. Uh, my background, I'm a physician by training. I'm actually one of the people that used to do house visits when I when I practiced in Belgium. <laughs> and in some ways, I feel like with Medable, it's coming full circle where now we're bringing trials to the homes of the participants or wherever they may be, right? It's just making it easier for, for people to participate. Um, so I'll leave it there for now and turn it over to Kim. Great. I love that work. I love it. And Kim. Hi, everyone. My name is Kimberly Barnholt. I work at Genentech Roche. Um, I am a evidence generation leader in our U.S. medical affairs evidence generation group. Um, we lead a lot of our post-marketing trials and um, partner on a lot of our U.S. run um, global trials. And um, my background is a scientist by training, and I've been fortunate at Genentech to see a lot of different lenses, um, starting first with industry collaborations. So the dime work is near and dear to my heart, um, and then moving into clinical operations um, and some data science groups. So very excited to see how this is all coming together. And I think kind of looking through all the different angles is the best way to tackle this problem and looking forward to the conversation today. Right. And, and we are all in partnership. You know, I work with you guys a lot, you know, mm -hmm. and you've been so genetic has been so supportive of my work, but I think it's, uh, it, it takes, I've, the, the people I've worked with have been like, okay, yeah, my baby is ugly or yeah, we may not be doing it the right way. You know, let, let's figure out a better way to do it. And I think we all have to come together to make this happen to, to make, you know, equitable and inclusive trials. So let's jump right in. Like, Hey, one major strength of our project team. I love our project team. It's having diverse stakeholders, like all, as we just have been saying. As you design and implement clinical trials, how are you incorporating expertise from other areas or, or other organizations? Just kind of doing the same kind of brain trust approach. Pam, do you want to tackle that one? Sure. So um, let me first position what we're doing at Science, because I think that will sort of uh, help us think this through. So we're we want to be leaders in advancing evidence base. So I totally agree with Dr. Kale if on that point that when you introduce new methodologies, we all have hopes for those methodologies. Our goal is at Metabolt to show how they work. Uh, I'd like to think that they do work, but we have to just understand how they work uh, so that we can have evidence-based fit for purpose application of DCTs. 
And um, when I think about how we approach diversity, we do a lot of, in, we're setting up a diversity plan for Medibol. Um, and what we're trying to do is sort of catalog all the things that we are doing so that we can verbalize that to our partners and be good partners when people like Kim and other, um, you know, pharma companies have to create these diversity plans. We hope to sort of contribute that. If you use DCTs, here's how that can contribute uh, to your diversity plan. So that's part of it. But then to learn about this, we do things like what we did with Dime. We participate um, on different um, efforts and their diversity things. So we're on the Pistoia Alliance that is looking at an angle of on diversity. Um, and then we're also on, on some other places. So we do a lot of collaborative work because we know that we can't get at this alone. And um, I do believe that, you know, starting this group, having, coming out with an idea that nobody had individually going in, I think is where the richness of working with groups like this is. Uh, so our approach is to work with others, to show what we are doing at Medibol and how we can help others in turn uh, by being good partners as they create their diversity plans. That's great, Kim. What do you think for um, for um, you know? I'm 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 the patient, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that you know I think everything starts with the patient or it's good, right? Um, how are you including the patient voice in your work? And I know yeah. the answer to that question from the work I'm doing. <laughs> No, it's a, it's a great question. And I think it's really critical to understand um, where the patients are and some of their concerns, their barriers to be able to understand how the trials we design, you know, really will impact their life. Our goal is to be patient centric, to reduce burden and make this an accessible option. Um, so we, we include the patient voice with a, a number of different ways. Um, you know, first and foremost, we have a very strong patient advocacy group at Genentech. So partnering with our internal patient advocacy group, as well as, you know, their extended partnerships with patient advocacy groups and allowing to get that more aggregated kind of broad reach patient perspective on some of our different trials um, and, and our approaches to different trials. We also um, sometimes for specific trials, we'll, we'll pull together a patient steering committee or a patient council and get more direct feedback on the approach on, you know, looking at some of the asks of the patient and how would this fit into their life? You know, how could we improve some of the design to ensure that this um, makes sense for patients, that they're, they would be able to comply given what they have, you know, in their lives. First and foremost, patients are people and, you know, patient is, a, is an element of it, right? And we need to make sure that we're designing for people and not just for the patient element of the person. Um, in terms of, and, and a lot of these things we try and do very early on in the process so that it's a design up front um, and, and rather kind of a rescue and try and fix later on. Um, the other thing that we do is we're trying to better understand how patients as they're going through trials are, um, you know, their experience on that. And so um, to Pam's point, you know, we're also very strong in the industry collaboration space. We've been longtime um, founding members of Transcelerate and Transcelerate has um, done an incredible amount to, to really connect the industry on some areas. And they have launched the um, study participant feedback questionnaire. So we do deploy these in some of our trials as well to be better understand not just about the design of a trial, but are there things we can do along the way to continue to you know, modify and, and improve the patient experience? That's and awesome. I think I probably would be amiss if I didn't add that when I joined Medibol, one of the reasons I joined the company and other people do too, is we have a patient advocacy council at Medibol, where a group of patients and caregivers can help us make sure that the, that the solutions we create will be helpful in the way that we hope they are. And then we also have a being people centered, I think also in include sites. Uh, and I know Genentech does a lot of work with sites as well, but we have a site network console so that we can also make sure that from that perspective, we have um, tools that are inclusive and they can give feedback and we tweak um, on, our, on our tools as well. So yes, in addition to the collaborations, we actually have internal groups that we've set up to sort of get that feedback as well. Yeah. Yeah. To build on that too, I think you're absolutely right that, you know, it takes a village to, to run a clinical trial and um, it is about the whole ecosystem coming together and, and, you know, figuring out how best do we optimize the, the science, the evidence, but also the experience. And that includes patients and includes sites um, and building on what Pam just said. Also, we have a number of groups internally that really are helping us to make sure we're understanding kind of the inclusive research lens. Um, we have it within U.S. Medical Affairs 
Affairs, we have a health equity and inclusive research group that we strongly partner with and actually run some trials really um, kind of focused on, on certain populations um, that have been traditionally underrepresented in trials. We also, um, I think it was in 2020, 2021, we launched the um, Advancing Inclusive Research Site Alliance, so partnership with Roche Genentech and some sites with the um, purpose of driving more inclusive research and enabling that. So absolutely, it takes the feedback of, of all of us coming together and, and driving this forward. And I was part of that research, the Advancing Inclusive, so it was, it was really a great great launch, launching pad for even for my work. Um, so how do you think our work on this project has made an impact and how are you gonna kind of take it forward? Um, Maybe like jumping in on this. Um, I mean, just the, the network that we built through the project has been really, yeah. um, okay. you know, it, it's been fantastic to hear the different lenses, to hear the different approaches. I know we spent quite a bit of time as a project team, just even sharing about some of the, the barriers and the frustrations. And I think just better understanding where everyone is coming from. Um, and then being able to share, you know, to, to solution and start to think about how can we come together and bring our different strengths, our different networks, our different um, lenses and, and actually tackle, you know, this challenge challenge and, and problem from all angles. Um, so I think just the network itself and, and the brain trust, which yeah. is the word I've heard quite a few times today, yeah. but the resources also um, are, are incredibly valuable. I think, you know, one of the things that we do in our trials is we try and look first at you know, as we're designing the, the opportunity from a science perspective, but also, um, you know, what are the opportunities? What are some of the challenges we foresee in operationalizing a trial and having the dime resources um, right. that really help identify here's some challenges that are, are known to be present in trials as you think about different approaches. And here's some solutions that are, um, you know, known to, to overcome and here's some examples and here's some how to. I think those are really valuable ways for us to start to demystify the how, um, as well as again, having the network that then we can rely on about um, thought partnership as we start to put these in practice. Yeah, I think we, um, we really did a, a great job. I keep bragging on us. Um, <laughs> They're just give, thinking through a lot of the issues that people are thinking about. And I think we did, you know, kind of, okay, what are all the issues? And I think we all came in it from a different perspective. So Pam, how would you answer that question, you think? So for us, the resources um, have been really useful to sort of the same, like using the brain trust, what everybody brought. It's an opportunity yeah. you don't often have to get that many people right. weighing right. and agreeing on something as <laughs> to what a good way forward is. So it helps us create a common language internally uh, it will help us we're working on deploying them but to create a common language but then some of the resources are also super specific and sort of it helps um you know with the patient advocacy council so there are specific resources as how to make sure that you do that right there are specific resources to for example e-consent how you sort of how can you think around diversity to make sure that your e-consent uh, solution you know make sure that it actually promotes it rather than maybe potentially being a hindrance because we all know about the digital divide. And so, so we're trying to just use all these resources as a whole. There's really good resources on how to create a dashboard to create transparency and accountability. So we're using them all to sort of incorporate them and yeah. into sort of creating a common language and a common path uh, for an organization like ours so that we can be good partners to people like Kim at Genentech or other people that we work with and, and be, you know, kind of help them in their path so that we can all do our little part. So we focus on the technology part of it and making sure that that part can be as best as it can be. And those resources are just incredibly helpful as a whole, because they were asking like, what specific one? And I'm like, it's all of them. It's all of them. All of them, <laughs> right? It's like Sophie's choice, right? Right, yeah, all of them. So everybody come back on. We're running out of time. I hate that, these webinars, right? So much good stuff talking about. Everybody come back on. Can all of our panelists come back on? And um, and let's just uh, let's do kind of a, a quick round robin of like, what kind of is your next step you're going to take after this work? What's your almost like your personal or organizational call to action that you're going to sort of take away? Because now we're going to separate. I don't like that. Like, like, so, so what are we going to, and how can we all like have a reunion in a few months, right? We got to, we got to work on that. You showed up, but like, what do you want to like, what do you want to sort of end with or start with in what you, in your work as we take this on? Um, Arkez, want to go first? Putting on the spot. 
Yeah, happy, happy to go first. I, I really do first want to acknowledge the great work. Again, I think it's been you know kind of established across the last hour or so that the that that the group, the working group, did a phenomenal job just really coming together with a framework to be able to move us forward. The key is is that we've talked about it. We've been, we've admired we've kind of admired the problem for so long, and it's now how do we move to actionable uh, steps and insights? And so leveraging these resources, leveraging these tools begins with begin to incorporating them into our obviously into our operations, op, incorporating them to our to our daily engagements, and then being able to obviously measure and gather evidence that this supports that these actual solutions are effective. So really it starts, you know, kind of fundamentally uh, in its approach, uh, familiarize yourself with them, make sure that we begin to distribute them accordingly, but then incorporating them and then measuring how we, uh, you know, measuring success once we deploy them. Right. Lunchtime is Reginald. Yeah, no, much to our case's point is I, I feel the same way. I share the same sentiments, um, but we also want to make sure that, that we're capturing um, the holistic picture of the patient or the participant or, or however we, we oh, incorporate it, right, right, right. Person, right? <laughs> so uh, I, I think certainly um, as we have came together, you know, I want to also kind of continue to come together, right, in, in future scopes to be able to always recalibrate, right, always look at how the market is changing, how patients are responding, because you know, it's going to evolve over time, right? And how do we look at the ways that we use technology to incorporate process and people in, in the same stream, in the same stroke? Awesome. That's it. It's all about the people, patients. Shelly? You know, I think for us, it's really important to, to get out there and talk to sponsors and talk to the organizations that we work with and understand how they're considering the staffing of their, their clinical trials and you know, if they are, if they understand that the background and the importance of, of hiring, um, you know, from different racial and ethnic minorities as staff in clinical trials and, and utilizing the resources that we've developed throughout DIME to, to help educate at every point of that, that process as well. And then, of course, engaging the PIs and the clinical trial staff that we work with and making sure that they're you know, keyed into this and in that, you know, they're aware of the implicit bias and understanding what they're doing from a personal perspective and the way that they're engaged in research and how they're, you know, working to, to change things as well. Right. Yeah. Kim? Yeah, I just want to build on what Shelly said. I love that about investing in, you know, the hiring as well as the 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 next, um, you know, talent of the future and really investing in, in kind of broadening um, the the diversity of all people involved in the healthcare ecosystem is a starting point. And I think, you know, often it's hard. The first step is is challenging. And I think this group coming together and all the work Dime's done before in this space, you know, or is providing those um, those abilities to overcome that first step, um, and actually the first several steps, um, by allowing us to not have to think about, you know, what should go in a diversity plan or how, what resources are available or solutions are available to tackle problem A, B, and C. And so having these more readily available, we can actually start to think about how do we move the needle forward? We have the framework, we have the questions, we have this, um, you know, the, the recommendations for the how we can start to put them into practice in, in our company and hopefully across the industry to start doing. Um, but then that's, you know, the first step, that's the first, you know, here and now. But again, I think it's also about continuing to look at hiring practices, education, um, partnerships with, um, you know, physicians who are seeing underrepresented patients. I think there's a whole wealth of things we can continue to do to just amplify the impact of the resources we've done. Awesome. Pam? Uh, so, yes, building upon everyone's um activities here it's going for us it's going back to the plan and sort of the dashboard and the metrics sort of what are we doing and how are we measuring uh, what role can we play in the evidence around this and the transparency around how technology can actually be a tool for increasing diversity versus maybe being another hindrance and thinking through what that may need, may be um, what we can what role we can play as a technology company uh, to help sponsors accomplish that yeah, to make technology our toolbox, right? Correct. So, you know, I love I love this conversation. You know, and I think it's all we're all intentional in our place in the ecosystem to get this work done. And 
And I don't believe we're going to get to um, health equity until everybody in our ecosystem practices the golden rule, which your mother taught you when you were two years old. Treat others how you want to be treated. And I see that in all of us, right, doing that work for us, that, that we all take this personally and say, we're going to make a difference. And I love that we're doing that. And I love you, Shoda, for bringing us all together. And um, yeah, I think she picked all of us, right? So like, I think we should like give her all the credit for, for this wonderful work. And I hope people will take these tools to heart because we did really think hard about them. And I think they're going to make a difference. You, Shoda, back to you, girl. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Arkes. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you, Reggie. Thank you, Ashish, who had to drop off early. Um, this has been a spectacular conversation and just the beginning, right? Um, we're not saying that we are going to fix the problem overnight. We're saying that it's time to start taking action, and we are here to help people take action. Um, I apologize that we didn't get to, to the questions but we will pull the questions and share share with the panelists. Um, and we will share some of the answers on the website along with the resources. We want that website to be a living resource for you for when you're thinking about health equity and clinical trials. And so we will have the resources on our website and we will have questions to, to help guide you and get you through that. Uh, I think one big takeaway from all of the discussions today, all of the conversations, it all comes back to respect for people, for patients, for participants, for all of us as people. Um, and going back to the quote from Dr. King about the in inequality and injustice, if we just focus on respecting each other, and then we, we think about how we all live, our lifestyles, our environment, and then we apply that we are in an ever evolving world and digital is front and center of that evolution. And not everyone's ready for it, but it's our job to make sure that everyone is ready for it. So that as we're using digital tools, as we're advancing with AI and everything else, no one gets left behind, that we're all in this together and we bring each other along with us. And with that, um, perfectly, I think, was echoed in our project team in the work we did. And I thank all of you so very much, not only for your time today, but for your dedication to this project and every one of the organizations and our 60 plus project team members um, for sharing your expertise, sharing your ideas, and especially sharing your personal stories. Everyone on on that project team had a personal story on how the lack of diversity, the lack of equity, and the lack of inclusion in clinical trials and in healthcare has affected their lives. And thank you for sharing and thank you for contributing to that for this project. Um, at DIME, this is what we do. We are trying to advance digital medicine with the help of all of our experts and our collaborators and so thank you all for joining us today and definitely stay tuned to learn about more projects from DIME and more work from hopefully this group, from new members, from new stakeholders joining us uh, so that together we can advance health equity as well as digital medicine. Thank you everyone. Have a great rest of your week. <laughs>